Attorney General of the United States directs the enforcement of federal laws. Attorney General Homer Cummings, head of the Department of Justice. Of this, one branch is the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the G-Men. This is a Bureau of Scientific Crime Detection. New, modern, up to the minute, in action day and night. The FBI never sleeps. The G-Men have become a legend. So what's the mystery behind their badge? There's heroism, we know that the memory of special agents who have given their lives to their duty. To them and to their families, this picture is dedicated. Soldiers in war while the world is at peace. The victorious war that the G-men have waged against organized crime. What mystery is there behind that triumph of law? Let's see. Let's ask J. Edgar Hoover, who as a young attorney became in 1924 director of the G-men. There is nothing mysterious about the manner in which the Federal Bureau of Investigation works. Its formula is a simple one. Intensive training, carefully investigated and highly efficient personnel, plus rigid requirements in regard to conduct, intelligence and integrity. A special agent must be a good marksman and have the courage to shoot it out with the most venomous of public enemies. He must know how to take fingerprints and what to do with them afterwards. He must know that no clue, no matter how seemingly unimportant, can be overlooked. He must have constantly before him the fact that science is a bulwark of criminal investigation. And he must realize that no case ever ends for the Federal Bureau of Investigation until it is solved and closed with the conviction of the guilty or the acquittal of the innocent. FBI, fidelity, bravery, integrity. And there's the war map. Pins tagged with the names of special agents and placed where the agents are. Mr. Tolson, I think it's going to be necessary to enlarge the detail of agents at Little Rock, Arkansas. So consequently, I think we will have to transfer two agents from St. Louis into Little Rock, selecting Agent Bush and Agent Hardy for that detail. All right, sir. And we'll have to send, I think, uh, possibly Agent Jones in from El Paso if he's finished his special assignment at the present time. He has finished that assignment, Mr. Hoover, but I might suggest Agent Montgomery of the Los Angeles office for that detail. I think that's an excellent selection. Yes. Have him uh, be sent by uh, air transportation. The nerve center of the FBI, the kidnap switchboard. Day and night it waits for the alarm in kidnapping and other dangerous crimes. Here the word flashed in the famous snatching cases. Urschel, Bremer, Weyerhaeuser. Calls that set the G-men on the trail. And the telephone number, if you should ever need it, is National 7117. This is National 7117. Just one moment, I'll connect you with Mr. Hoover. From here, headquarters controls the army of G-men. The teletype, absolutely secret communication, directing the work of the 37 field divisions of the FBI. In touch, likewise, with hundreds of police departments everywhere. Over this teletype were sent the orders in the hunt for Dillinger, Babyface Nelson, Pretty Boy Floyd, the Barker Carpus mob, and those other notorious public enemies. Now the fingerprints. But don't think that the G-men deal entirely with crime. Not in this scene, for this is fingerprinting that's ordinary routine in everyday life. People record their prints and their children's, too, for protection. Citizens like John D. Rockefeller, Jr. A thousand sets like these come in each day. No connection with the criminal records, a section far removed from crime. Suppose there's a tornado, there may be lost children needing identification. Unidentified bodies are recovered in any natural disaster. Each year, 200,000 people disappear. 3,000 unknown a year are buried in potter's fields. Their amnesia cases, loss of memory, all these could be instantly identified by fingerprints which remain unchanged throughout life. Now the criminal records. Here they receive fingerprint inquiries from local police authorities at the rate of 4,000 a day. Somebody arrested somewhere. What's his record? Is he a fugitive from justice? His fingerprints are sent to the FBI. The experts conduct a search. The prints sent in are in all 10 fingers. They are searched against 10 finger records. There are more than six and a half million sets of these on file, so classified that the right one can be identified in less than three minutes. There it is, under the magnifying glass it matches. That man's record will be sent to the local police. He's an old offender and can't deny it. A machine can make the search. The fingerprints that we are trying to match have certain characteristics. The mechanism is adjusted accordingly. This adjustment will pick out a punch card perforated to represent the fingerprint characteristics we are looking for, a hundred times as fast as any clerk. 
There's the card. The punch mark corresponds to a fingerprint card in the file, so we select that one. We match it, and we can't miss. Our fingers have designs of loops, whorls, and lines like a tent. No two individuals have ever been found with fingerprints exactly alike. The chance of a mistake is one in an undecillion. The figure one followed by 36 ciphers. This man is wanted for murder. The FBI fingerprint service identifies an average of 500 fugitives from justice a month. The service is free to the police everywhere. The police can take a 10-finger record of a prisoner, but at the scene of a crime, you may find only one print or a part of one. Here in this single fingerprint file are classified the prints of individual fingers of 15,000 dangerous criminals, bank robbers, kidnappers, racketeers. When a single finger impression is found at the scene of a crime, it's checked against these. The original clue in the Kansas City massacre and the Bremer kidnapping was a single fingerprint. Women criminals, 400,000 of them. Notorious female crooks and gangster malls more deadly than the male. The last word in completeness, the moniker file, criminal nicknames. This solves crimes. I wonder what a sweet mama cat looks like. Here's where the crime record closes with a full stop. Full stop for these criminals, dead ones. Here you'll find notorious names that made evil headlines of crime. Some public enemies were sent to prison by the G-men. Others are here in this file. Dillinger brought to Chicago, recaptured after he had escaped from Lima, Ohio, taken to Crown Point, Indiana, the Lake County Jail to be tried for the murder of a policeman. Desperate public enemy now rises to fame as an underworld hero. Arrogant, that expression in his eyes. The welcome accorded to a vicious man killer. In spite of all this guard, he escaped once more using the sheriff's car. By driving this stolen car across the Indiana state line to Chicago, he violated a federal law for the first time, and that put the G-men on his trail. This led to the raid of Little Bohemia. The Dillinger mob hid away in this Wisconsin resort. These dogs gave the alarm when the federal agents closed in at night. A gun battle and Special Agent W. Carter Baum was shot and killed by the thrice paroled babyface Nelson. John Hamilton, Dillinger aide, wounded, he later died. And that set the wheels of justice grinding with a vengeance. Half a million of these wanted notices went far and wide. They got him outside this motion picture theater. Wild excitement. Dillinger killed by federal agents commanded by Inspector Samuel Cowley, assisted by East Chicago, Indiana police. The belongings of public enemy number one. Three men couldn't carry Dillinger's collection of deadly weapons seized at various places. He had this automatic in hand when killed. His fingerprints, the infallible sign. He spent $5,000 to have them altered with acid, but it failed. 300 points of similarity remain. His face made over, but the G-men recognized him. The eyes and the shape of his head. Tagged in the morgue. Dillinger's pal, Babyface Nelson, murderer of Agent Baum. He was driving with gangster chase. A gun battle with special agents Hollis and Cowley. Cowley who trapped Dillinger, and both G-men were killed. Nelson, mortally wounded, 17 wounds. The G-men sprayed him with bullets as they lay dying. Oklahoma City telephoned National 7117, and that began the wide ramifications of the Urshel kidnap case. The wealthy oil man snatched. From Denver, Colorado was brought Albert Bates, who was tried along with his fellow mobster, Harvey Bailey. They are identified by Mrs. Urshel in open court. She is pointing out Bates. The investigation covered 23 states. Before a federal judge, oil man Urshel also identifies Bates. And Bates and Bailey are sentenced for life. Afterward, a plane brings Machine Gun Kelly and his wife, Catherine, from Memphis, Tennessee. Less than 90 days after the kidnapping, 15 were convicted. Six get life. Before the judge, Machine Gun Kelly and his woman get theirs. 
Of the $200,000 in ransom paid, $123,000 was recovered and returned. Bates, Bailey, and Kelly in Alcatraz. When Machine Gun Kelly was captured, he begged, G-Men don't shoot, meaning government men, and the name G-Men flashed in the news. In St. Paul, Edward G. Bremer was kidnapped by the Barker Carpus mob. The trail led to this cottage at Lake Weir at Oklawaha, Florida. There was a desperate four-hour gun battle. Ma Barker, mother and leader of bandits, was killed with her gangster son, Fred. Ma Barker was firing one of those machine guns when she died. Here in New Orleans, Alvin Carpus was captured with J. Edgar Hoover directing after a nationwide search. Carpus was afraid of fingerprints. Here's the G-Man record. He had the tips of his fingers sliced by a knife. No use. His fingerprint characteristics identified him just the same. He had his face lifted, his ears clipped. But look at his eyes, same old creepy. This ransom letter was turned over to the FBI. Nine-year-old George Weyerhauser kidnapped. They made him sign the back of the envelope as identification to his parents. The G-men made a searching study of this elaborate kidnap message. It gave a list of the size of the bills to be paid in the ransom money, $200,000. Sign, egoist, egoist. The money was paid and that was the clue in the case. The FBI has a nationwide system of hunting down kidnapped cash. The G-men made up a list of their own. Washington presses ground out hundreds of thousands of these. They circularized the nation, banks, stores, and filling stations, any place where money might be spent. The kidnapped boy was returned on June 1st, and arrests were made on June 8th. Quick work. And the trail led to Salt Lake City, where in this 5 and 10, one of the bills on the list was changed to buy this cigarette case. And swiftly, an airplane was taking Harmon Whaley and his wife to Tacoma for trial. He gets 45 years, she gets 20 years. But there was still another fugitive wanted, William Mayer. And once more, the trail of the ransom money, that list of kidnap bills. He had to spend the money and couldn't do it without putting the G-men on his trail. At this California hotel, he was registered as B.E. Cole. Once more, the plane ride. The FBI is air-minded. That's why these cases were polished off so swiftly. Mayan had $37,000 of the ransom money and gets 60 years. And so grinds the machinery of the law at the FBI. These are bank robbers. The G-men protect more than 14,000 banks. They have reduced bank robberies by 75%. Let's see how all of this is done. First, it's selection, picking the right man. To become a G-man, you must be between 25 and 35 years old. All lawyers are expert accountants. There are myriads of applications, but only one applicant in a thousand is chosen. Each receives three and a half months of intensive training before he tackles a job. Physical training, or a special agent must be fit. The FBI training is not only for G-men, Police officers from select communities in the United States take the FBI course in Washington. There in the jiu-jitsu class may be a law officer from anywhere. There are FBI graduates in 81 police departments that represent the law for 66 million people. The law library for legal study by the agents and by the FBI police academy students. Planning a raid, the art of attacking a gangster stronghold, how to take cover battle strategy in the war against crime. Each field division has this complete equipment. Handcuffs, leg irons, high-powered glasses, searchlights, receptacles for evidence, fingerprint kits, cameras. The G-men have killed only nine public enemies, but these were the most dangerous, the deadliest of killers, gun in hand. Others surrendered through fear, because the FBI policy is always to have its G-men better armed than the underworld, to have better weapons and to use them better. The agents must qualify every 30 days as marksmen to be ready for new Dillingers, new Babyface Nelsons. Machine gun sharpshooting from a fast moving car.
Roger Hoover supervising field practice, and the target might be a gangster car. This is what happened to Bonnie Parker and Clyde Barrow in a battle with local officers. The rifle range at Bureau headquarters in Washington, and the targets might be gangsters. Intermittent firing. Now, 600 shots a minute. hits the anatomy of that theoretical public enemy. He will kill and kidnap no more. The G-men at the scene of murder, an experimental case at the crime detection laboratory. The victim, affectionately known as Oscar. A typical set of clues, everything placed in cellophane to keep it in original condition. The murderous weapon never touched by hand so as not to obliterate fingerprints. The FBI students in solving the murder of Oscar find a partly eaten apple. A drinking glass is a likely place for fingerprints. Everything is examined for these telltale marks. And there, up pops fingerprints made by Oscar or the killer. Here's where we'll find out. The scientific crime-busting laboratory where sleuthing is done by ultra-modern technology. The great period of G-Men scientific crime detection began in 1934 when Congress, at the request of the Attorney General, enacted a series of crime bills placing interstate crimes such as kidnapping, bank robbery, extortion, and transportation of stolen goods under federal jurisdiction. That made crime detection a national science. Now with convictions in 97% of the cases the FBI has brought to trial, not including the murder of dear old Oscar. On that gun are fingerprints. They will convict the killer. This is the G-Man science which has helped in the conviction of more than 11,000 federal offenders during the last three years. There are fingerprints on the glass to clinch the conviction. The FBI costs $5 million a year while the amount of fines, savings, and recoveries of property exceeds $35 million a year. And now the telltale fingerprint is enlarged 400 times on a screen for the detailed study and comparison in avenging the cruel murder of Oscar. Remember that half-eaten apple? Teeth marks in it. They use moulage to study that. Moulage is a kind of paste that hardens and makes a perfect reproduction of objects. John Hamilton, brains of the Dillinger gang, shot by the G-men, died later and was buried by the mob in corrosive lye. When the G-men found the body, it could only be identified by his teeth and dental work. Teeth mean much to the skilled investigator. The footprint at the scene of the crime, reproduced by a plaster cast. This might be the mark left by any one of the 12,000 murderers who kill each year in the United States. They do this same thing with the marks of tire treads. Then the plaster cast is matched with FBI blueprints of every known tire tread design. Moulage reproduction is so perfect, you can hardly tell the copy from the original. There's cunning murder in the 45 automatic, which was made into a machine gun for Babyface Nelson. The cast of a hand might keep the record of a scar so perfect that you can take fingerprints from it. The handwriting expert tells us, if you write, you are caught. And here we find how far the work of the G-Man reaches out beyond gangs, robbery, and murder. The FBI is responsible for investigations under 75 federal statutes from antitrust laws to espionage, from bank frauds to treason, crimes on Indian reservations to bankruptcy. 
You can't disguise your handwriting. You can try, but you won't fool the G-man. The evidence in a real case, a pair of trousers, they were sent to the FBI by the sheriff at Wachula, Florida. A powerful vacuum extracts the dust from the cloth. Will this match with the soil at the scene of the murder? If it does, it will prove that the man who wore those trousers was at the scene of the murder. The dust is examined by a microscopist. He peers through a petrographical microscope with polarized light. And this scientific laboratory service is available without cost to every police department of this nation. Chula, Florida murder case, this was a critical clue, a stain on the trousers. Was it human blood? The chemical solvent is filtered through and transfers the substance of the stain to filter paper, which is put through a cunning chemical test. The FBI laboratory is equipped to analyze any substance that may be found at the scene of a crime. The chemical test for blood, by applying a few drops of colorless benzidine and hydrogen peroxide. This will detect blood diluted as much as one part in 300,000. Even laundering does not remove the trace of blood from cloth. If that's blood, the chemical reaction will form a vivid blue. It does. The experts testify and the murderer is sentenced to electrocution. One of these four knives was used to cut a screen. This was evidence in the burglary of a government office. The knife that cut the screen will have in its edge minute particles of the zinc and copper of the screen wire. The invisible particles on the knife are burned in an electric arc. The light emitted is passed through prisms and forms a spectrum. Spectrographic analysis. Astronomers use it to analyze the stars. G-men use it to detect crime. The band of light shows the characteristic lines of zinc and copper, proving that the knife cut the screen and that the owner of the knife is guilty. Gangster guns, each with a murderous history. The 45 caliber revolver carried by Alvin Carpus. A gangster's gun seized, and it may have fired a bullet found in the victim's body. Pretty boy Floyd's gun. He didn't notch it. He notched his watch charm ten times. Here's how the G-men proved that a certain bullet was fired from a certain gun. You can shoot a bullet into cotton, and it will retain the gun barrel marking. These are studied by ballistics experts. Scratches and striations, as individual as fingerprints. This is a comparison microscope. The eyepiece brings the two bullets into juxtaposition and matches exactly those markings and striations. When the criminal fires a shot, the gun marks the bullet as if he had written his name on it. So here's the handwriting on the bullet, an open page for the G-men to read. The light that shines in the gun, the helixometer, a powerful electric bulb, no bigger than a grain of wheat. It reveals the story within the gun barrel when it was fired last. You can tell even who owned it and the pocket in which it was carried by the tiny bits of lint from claw. Yes, the science that has hunted down all those public enemies and solved every one of those notorious kidnappings. There's no crime that cannot be solved. The firing pin that hits the cartridge can reveal a criminal and firing pins launch the fire that blazes away the menace of organized crime. Rain or shine, the special agents are ready for combat with public enemies. trigger men, but prepared to shoot and shoot straight.
There are three needs in America today in law enforcement. The elimination of politics from law enforcement, emphasis on efficiency, and cooperation between police agencies. We should all be concerned with but one goal, the eradication of crime. The Federal Bureau of Investigation is as close to you as your nearest telephone. It seeks to be your protector in all matters within its jurisdiction. It belongs to you. That means, gangsters, you can't get away with it.